good afternoon good evening colleagues friends fellow to the world uh, this is kazi amdadul haq from friendship bangladesh welcoming you for the session number 6 and taking a climate justice approach to locally led adaptation and you know we are aware that the out of eight principles of locally led adaptation principle 2 of the locally adaptation advocates for addressing the structural inequalities faced by women youth disabled displaced indigenous people and marginalized groups the climate crisis disproportionately impacts those social groups and further affects their rights to live in a healthy and secure environment including their rights to health to food to clean water to education to development to cultural heritage etc today's session round table discussion breakout groups uh, will share the experiences from different parts of the world at the same time ideas how really we can take this challenge forward to address those inequalities and we also learn about how human rights perspective can be reflected here so uh, let me welcome all the participants speakers panelists and hope uh, you will be part of the breakout sessions and contribute to your points to make this issue very vibrant let me take you the logistics and and ask very quickly uh this cbs section and then uh you know the iid is recording the meeting and may make parts of it available on iid website at a later date we have taken security precaution to discourage in uninvited participants from joining the meeting and posting in appropriate comments or other contents please if you find someone please report us use chat box for the best experience of this meeting please close all non essential applications on your device particularly messaging apps such as skype or teams uh you all are familiar uh, initially your microphone will be muted by the host during the breakout session later in the meeting you will be able to unmute your mic by clicking on the icon same for a uh, start video but you can share your webcam video if you choose if you experience connections problem you should try turning your video off the participants icon will open a panel on the right of the screen where you can interact with the host using the icons at the button and chat chat will open a panel where you can enter your comments and question a request technical support will respond to as many as time allows uh, these are the you know share is for the presenters are aware about the share screen record i mentioned already reaction definitely you can uh, share your reaction then next uh this is only for you can update your name to let you let us know who you are and your organization go to the participants then select more and rename and finally the taking a climate justice approach to locally led adaptation session objectives examine how structural inequalities and root vulnerabilities adversely impact communities most affected by climate change and the present some best practices in addressing climate justice in local vulnerable communities with these two objectives let me welcome runa khan founder and executive director of friendship to open the session ms runa khan <laughs> thank you very much amdad and thank you very much i'm so happy to be here and uh, welcome to her royal highness princess esmeralda of belgium distinguished guest and my fellow respected colleagues so today we are here in with with a subject i think which is very close to all our hearts it's a subject of inequality inequity both it's a it's a subject which we all know somehow like for example the climate impacts those who are not uh 
those who are responsible for the climate impacts, <laughs> for, the, for the climate disasters today, it's impacting them maximum. In the same way, the women and uh, the children, the youth, the disabled, you know, displaced are the displaced people who are the frontliners of bearing the brunt when a disaster strikes. And it is this understanding and working with these communities over the past 20 years that we have come to realize that if we just lend them a hand, they are such enablers of taking care of their own lives. If we just ensure that they have a platform and not quicksand on which to stand, they can rise and be the voice of a community, of the whole nation. And it is with this belief that step by step, we need to ensure that no one is left behind because somehow it is always the vulnerable, the women, and that injustice of this, they are left behind. Those who cannot walk, those who are, and that, that is men and women, of course, all those who are not in the mainstream of, uh, of, of our, of our um, view, they are not always in our vision, you know, when we are seeing what is happening, that they are the ones who need to be addressed the most. Addressed so that they can be pulled out and pulled up to become part of the mainstream. And climate change, this, uh, it is so unfortunate that the understanding of, of, the, of the adaptability of these, of, I'm sorry about the noise that's coming. Uh, and in climate change, the understanding of climate change, these people, they don't understand it. They feel it every single day when it's happening to them. And we in friendship to ensure justice for them is, has been one of the, what was one of the reasons why I started this organization 20 years ago. It is to ensure that they get hope, they get dignity in their lives, and they have equal opportunity to be able to jumpstart on this, uh, their life again. And I totally know that uh, with uh, the input, whatever input, in whatever capacity we are in, working in solidarity, if we have this one vision of ensuring that they stand on this platform with equity, ensuring equity, that it would help not only the climate victims, the women, but all those who are left behind, because we can then set a trail of example which can be followed for the future. I wholeheartedly believe that today's session, we have incredible guests. We have people of great experience who will share with us and there will be so much learning. And I hope together in solidarity, we can step forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Runa Khan, founder and executive director of Friendship. And uh, uh, once again, uh, please, if you need interpretation, uh, and then uh, is, find the button for interpretation and select English. And then that would help for proper listening. And again, welcome you all. And now taking you for presentation and happy uh, to have you, Her Royal Highness Princess Melda. And thanks for joining with us. And now Aisha Khan, Aisha Tahsin Khan from Friendship Bangladesh will share her presentation. I mean, uh, a talk followed by a video, best practices in addressing climate justice in local vulnerable communities of Bangladesh. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your, the invite. Um, Bangladesh is amongst uh, the most vulnerable and the most affected country in the world, uh, affected by climate change. Uh, therefore, this country really becomes a, a, a perfect case study for those who are better trying to understand uh, how climate change impacts vulnerable countries. Whether it be extreme drought, as it takes place in Bangladesh, 
or an over uh, abundance of water flow coming down from the north and the west of the country. We are now facing really the brunt, and the catastrophe of this climate change at a very, very fast rate. Under these circumstances, we need to be innovative using locally led climate-based adaptation methods to best serve the local communities. Social injustice is a cruel outcome of climate-led displacement. It is under these landscape that we work. Islands that are constantly shifting, this, this phenomenon of alluvial and diluvial islands makes internal migration their way of life. These communities are not even able to apply for birth registration, nor for their national identity card, or sign up to register to vote due to difficulties of the terrain where going to the mainland costs them a day's wage. Locally led adaptation practices, we, uh, by locally led adaptation practices, we have been able to deliver access to government services, along with enable access to justice, whether it's climate justice, whether it's justice of, of the human rights nature. From within these island communities, we have been able to train community paralegals who are able to bridge the gap between this being serviceless and voiceless to delivering citizenship services to them at their doorstep. The interaction between government and citizens has improved and the community is now able to access government safety nets by using or visiting these paralegals. All assistance for these government services or legal services is now delivered to the citizen's doorstep. And this is all by using the locally led adaptation process. Further, various tools and systems have been put in place where informal justice and resolutions are provided by working with the local civil society, elders of the community, local government bodies and institutes. We now have a functioning system that is not only locally led and adapted, but very replicable by any country in the world. Further, I'd like to mention, not only are we working with the marginalized people, but from within those marginalized, we have further marginalized groups who are those persons with disabilities. There too, by using local people and, local and the local community, we have been able to put in place steps to, to assist these persons with disability. By providing accessibility to health, freedom of expression, good practice, and further by income generation activities. Living standards for the persons with different difficult persons with disabilities by empowering their communities, the persons that they have uh, and their family too, uh, use the access to justice system we are, that we have placed on the ground so that they are not excluded of any rights uh, and included into society by creating a supportive environment. I leave it here by saying that locally led adaptation in this case the delivery again of the government service, uh, safety net services, the use of legal aid, legal case handling by lawyers, informal justice delivery, basically all in all, justice and inclusive citizenship is now possible by locally led adaptive or community-based adaptive methods. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Situated in the heart of the river islands, the streams look like snakes crisscrossing the landscape from above. One of the world's largest rivers, the Jomuna gives rise to sedimentary deltas called chores and also erodes them on a regular basis. Chores in the Jomuna survive roughly three years before succumbing to erosion. The lives of chore residents are subject to frequent formation and destruction of these islands, both along the Jomuna River as well as the Brahmaputra, Dhorola, Dutkumar and Tista. Most chores in the north are under the jurisdiction of Gaibanda and Kurigram districts. 
Though, aside from being citizens of Bangladesh, the residents of more than 300 chores are deprived of their basic rights and have no access to the essential infrastructure, goods, and services due to the isolation and impermanence of these islands. <laughs> Despite there being government schools and healthcare facilities, health workers, teachers, and other authorities are often unable to perform their duties due to the difficult commute. Detached from the mainland, illiteracy, child marriage, dowry, and other social anomalies are rampant. However, chore residents are now eager to get rid of such social anomalies. The cycle of poverty stakeholders, duty bearers, other engagement are on a better empowerment uh, is very important. When the government portion is not a legal aid, absolutely a role model. But we have to impact special phenomena data strictly related to the chore. Mainland a phenomenon marginalized challenges face mainland face feel that the chore to tailor made it's tailor made specialist in we have to come up with innovative ideas. For example, Great. Thank you so much, uh, Aisha Tahsin Khan, uh, for the great presentation. Senior Director of Friendship Bangladesh. And now I, I would request, please uh, raise your question, comments, share ideas, any experiences using chat box. Our colleagues are here and they will respond immediately or we'll connect you. And now I will hand over the session to Hilary Hitt, Climate Justice Resilience Fund. Hilary. Thank you, Kazi. Um, my name is Hilary Heath. I'm the program associate for the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. I am based uh, in Washington, D.C., and I'm happy to be joined by two wonderful panelists. Um, Adrian and Malin, could you turn on your videos, please, and join me? Um, if I could have Story Tile or Jackie's uh, spotlight, Adrian and Madeline, please. Hi, Lily, I'm here. Hi, Madeline. Just bear with us as we work out the tech issues. Hello. Okay. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Madeline. Um, so we have about 30 minutes for this conversation, and um, we've prepared some questions. And why don't we start with Madeline? Madeline, could you please introduce yourself and give us a brief introduction to the inequalities you see in your work? Hello, everyone. My name is Madeline Imeliji. I'm from The Gambia. I work at Chocolabs Banjo an innovation hub with focus on ICT for development and education. And now also we're into climate change. I'm the business development manager and I'm also an SDG and climate change advocate. Over the couple of years, we've realized in Gambia, the digital divide that is affecting 
the rural communities with with the inequalities that we've so far observed in regards to the digital divide and knowing that a lot of young people and women in rural Gambia do not have access to digital skills. Realizing this, we decided to come up with digital inclusion adv and advocacy trainings to empower these women using digital skills, especially women farmers in rural Gambia. Focusing on the four rural regions in the Gambia, the West, um, the, the lower river region, not bank region, central river region, and the upper river region, where we offer digital literacy trainings to these women in order to empower them to use WhatsApp for business and Facebook to market their products. Also, we realized that most of the young people in rural Gambia do not have access to entrepreneurship skills that can empower them to take up initiatives in their communities. With this in mind, we launched the coding mapping and climate change project focusing on young people in rural Gambia using open street maps to teach them how to map out geospatial sites in their communities that could empower and create visibility for their rural communities. With this in mind, we have created a lot of opportunities with young people and now in climate change, we have partnered with organizations like the Great Institute to map out the saline water institution that is currently happening and affecting farmers in rural Gambia, especially those in the North Bank area, the Upper River region and the Central River region, which used to be a haven where rice production was mostly implemented. But now because of the saltwater intrusion, most of the farmers are affected leading to migration happening in the North Bank, where people in the North Bank are moving to to the West Coast region in search of better farmland areas. So in the Gambia, we notice and taking into account all these things that are happening. We realize that using a digital approach through innovation, we could empower young people and women who were at the forefront of, of implementing the type of Gambia that we want, especially in the work they do as farmers and as entrepreneurship, realizing that 91% of the poor people in the Gambia are farmers and realizing that 75% of the women in these sectors are also farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Adrian, could you also please briefly introduce yourself and give us an introduction to the inequalities you see in your work? Yeah, thank you, Hilary. Thanks everyone for having me here. Um, I'm Adrian Bani Lasimbang. Um, I'm from Sabah, Malaysia. I'm a Kadazan uh, from the ethnic indigenous group uh, in Borneo. Um, and um, I'm actually working for an organization called Tonibu. Um, it is an indigenous led organization. We are also a social enterprise, basically um, providing um, uh, trainings for local youths, especially for our um, on renewable energy. So um, I have seen many of uh, inequalities among the communities in, in Borneo, particularly that we can see that uh, there's still a lot of energy poverty in terms of um, gap uh, that uh, you know, large numbers of communities, especially in the remote areas, have no access to electricity. And nowadays, uh, electricity is also one of the most basic uh, requirement or necessity for life and um, we have done several studies and we have identified at least uh, 400 over village uh, that is just in, in, in within my province of Sabah uh, that is unaltrified and uh, we have seen how uh, this uh, lack of access to electricity have uh, impoverished communities um, and we're talking about you know, the digital divide that is ever, ever widening because of the lack of infrastructure. And uh, we have been seeing that you know, without electricity, there is also a lot of uh, uh, missed opportunity for indigenous communities in terms of um, education, um, you know, e-commerce and whatever is coming up. So basically that's in a nutshell what we're doing. Um, our organization runs uh, a center called CREATE, Center for Renewable Energy and Appropriate Technologies, that is conducting uh, renewable energy 
uh, R&D and also training for our local youths. Um, thank you, Adrian. It's apt that the two of you have both mentioned the digital divide today. We did have a third panelist and because of um, rains and winds and the, the Amazon, they are unable to connect to our, our call today. We do have a pre-recorded message from our third panelist, who is Kasiko and Gaho, who is a, a, a village elder or village chief uh, in the in Brazil. So I'm going to go ahead and play the video. Um, Kasiko and uh, went ahead and answered all three questions that the panelists will discuss in this video. If you do not speak Portuguese, please turn on your um, interpretation for English, and we do have an interpreter who will interpret the video. Ayokuan, bom dia. Meu nome é Cassi Cangorró. Venho aqui né, para constatizar vocês a situação eh, hoje que estamos vivendo. Eh, nós conseguimos construir a primeira aldeia indígena eh, na região metropolitana de Belo Horizonte após sermos atingidos pelo crime da Vale em Brumadinho. Eh, Essa comunidade ela está sendo construída dentro de uma área de RPPM, onde uma cidade que nos discrimina por eu ser uma cacica mulher, estar à frente da luta. Então, a gente enfrenta aqui vários obstáculos. Temos aqui uma degradação ambiental muito grande por, por parte das mineradoras. Estamos numa situação de luta contra a situação climática da região, lutando... É, por eles estarem devastando e dominando toda a área de RPPM, áreas preservadas que a gente tem em torno das duas cidades que compõem a nossa comunidade, que é Brumadinho e São Joaquim de Bico. A outra é, fa, é, situação que a gente tem dentro do contexto, por eu ser cacica e ser mulher, é que nós, mulheres indígenas, que estamos aí lutando pela situação climática e chegando aos cargos de cacicado, muitas das vezes não somos vistas e nem notadas. Passamos por várias discriminação racial, principalmente por não termos a característica dos parentes da Amazônia. Nós, indígenas que vêm dos contextos do Nordeste, né, por sermos é, indígenas mestiços, é, temos passado grandes preconceitos. É, muitas das vezes não conseguimos é, concorrer nos fundos que tem dentro aí da, do contexto da ONG que contempla a Amazônia. E a gente vem pedir socorro. A minha comunidade hoje, a gente está vencendo esse preconceito, fazendo evento, convidando a, a cidade e região metropolitana para participar, para ver nossos artesanatos, ver como nós vivemos, e ver de perto e acompanhar o nosso trabalho. Onde eu estou falando com vocês agora, eu estou falando dentro da nossa sala de aula, que foi fundada por nós, onde a gente conseguiu construir a primeira escola de língua de, da, da, do contexto da região metropolitana de onde a gente está. A gente pede aí a vocês que venham ver a realidade das comunidades que estão, sem ser na Amazônia também, que estão no Nordeste, que estão no Sul e no Centro-Oeste do Estado brasileiro, que vem sofrendo com essa situação climática. E a forma que a gente está de enfrentar a situação climática dentro dos nossos territórios é que a gente está fazendo o resgate das nascentes, a gente está fazendo o florestamento de uma área que está toda é, sendo devastada por esses grileiros. A gente tem aí o apoio de vocês, os apoiadores têm abraçado essa causa. Então, a gente pede socorro e pede que vocês venham ver a realidade das nossas comunidades. Sorry, I am dialing in and cannot hear the interpretation, so I didn't want to cut our interpreter off. Um, but thank you to Kasika and Gaho for taking the time to record that message and for uh, to Ali Hedman for uh, translating it into English. Um, Adrian, why don't I start with you for our second question? 
Can you tell us a bit more how uh, your organization is working to address the inequalities you're seeing in the context you mentioned? Yeah, um, for us in Tonibung, we we use the or we base our work on the SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable De Development Goals, and particularly we are looking at Goal Number Seven, which is providing clean and affordable energy. And um, we have been trying to work towards uh, making renewable energy to be affordable, and not just affordable, but it is accessible to indigenous communities because a lot of these technologies are also in the hands of big corporations, big companies. And what we are trying to do is to look at indigenous um, technologies that is developed by our own organization. And we also work towards, um, you know, uh, with like-minded organization around the region uh, through an open source uh, knowledge sharing so that we can make sure that uh, um, our local communities can also um, you know, have access to these technologies. For example, like the micro hydro mini grid systems that we have been building uh, with the communities. And we have been using these micro hydro systems to incentivize um, you know, uh, communities to protect watershed uh, areas. And uh, this community watershed is very important because Without the conservation of the forest, um, there is no sustained um, flow of river that runs to operate our micro hydro system. So this is like basically, uh, you know, providing the community what is um, they need. For example, electricity, but at the same time, uh, it incentivizes conservation of nature using traditional knowledge and wisdoms. Um, through uh, the available energy, we also work towards uh, empowering women, especially in uh, socioeconomic development, because uh, now uh, we have 24-hour electricity, but we don't want to stop just by providing lights. We also want to see productive and use of energy. And uh, we have been working towards um, designing or uh, participatory design of programs together with uh, communities and uh, the women and also youths in the community to design what are the productive and use uh, systems or um, programs that they have they need so a lot of it also involves um, you know providing the skills uh, and also the opportunity to process um, uh, agriculture products make it um, have longer life shelf have higher value and nowadays with online during covid uh, pandemic, uh, the on shopping or sh online marketing have been really an important part of how we can uh, bring our indigenous products to 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 the world, and we have been trying to uh, build the capacity of our uh, different um, communities to um, market some of those products that is processed from the village um, through intermediary organization like us to, 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 to market this to, to, to the world. So I think um, in, in a nutshell, we are trying to look at different ways approach in terms of empowering the community, not just by providing um, you know, the, the energy, the technology, but also providing them the space to develop together. And you know, uh, we are just uh, providing them the uh, technical um, know-how but the driving seat basically is the community who is designing the, uh, the, the program for themselves. So that, that's how our approach is. That's why we call our uh, project um, community-based model. Um, and we are really uh, looking at how this um, in, uh, can encourage uh, more community self-help, uh, I might say self-help uh, programs in order for us to to be more resilient uh, in facing uh, the different threats of climate change, economic you know, uh, the, uh, recession and so on. So that's how we're doing it uh, basically in, in some. Um, thank you, Adrian, for those various interventions that you've explained. Um, Madeline, can you respond to the same question? How are How is your organization working to address the inequalities you're seeing in your context? 
in Jokolab's Banjo, we are trying to address the inequalities observed by promoting digital inclusion. Currently, we have the Youth and Digital Inclusion Program going on for youths in rural Gambia, where we're focusing on privacy, data, security, and access by ensuring that we are providing young people with the digital literacy skills to empower themselves, especially with what they can do with data, especially with contributing to the work of the Open Street Map chapter in the Gambia. We're also part of the Internet Governance Forum, and every year we gather with other stakeholders, both in the private and the public sector, to discuss issues affecting connectivity, access, and affordability. Where this is done in order to promote the development of community networks, as well as get the government involved in ensuring that the connectivity issues affecting people in rural Gambia and the high cost of um, internet, internet in the Gambia, which is affecting literally everyone, especially which is hindering the development of good educational research to promote entrepreneurship in ways that young people can contribute to the climate movement by providing solutions that are sustainable. We are also We're also supporting the development of community, community networks in the Gambia by focusing on two very key rural areas, the North Bank region and Basse, which is, which is in the URI, as well as also contributing to our work in education, engaging with young people in schools through our after school program, the summer camp and our African code challenge. Empowering young people as well also part of the Generation Global Forum, using lectures from there to engage young people with dialogue on climate change, on access, on privacy, on data, as well as on those related to innovation that is going to contribute immensely to the work that we do as a social change hub. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Madeline, why don't I start, start with you for this, this last question. Um, those most vulnerable to climate change are often excluded from decision-making spaces. How can we support and build power for the most vulnerable of communities? To do that here in Jokolaps Banju, we focus all of our projects that we do, we make sure that we involve the municipal area councils so that we can get the associations working in the grassroots movement to be part of the work that we do. Like for instance, if we have a project in the North Bank area, we link up with the municipal council in the North Bank area, where we engage with the farmers association there, and they can identify those in their areas who are in most need of the trainings that we offer. Through collaboration and partnership, we are able to hear, not just by going there and delivering our training models to them, but in advocacy, we're also able to hear what are the issues that are affecting them and how are they in their own way trying to shape it and how can we better um, our fight in ensuring that digital inclusion also gets to them. The dialogues happening within the greater Banjo area and the West Coast area that they also have a seat with have a seat at the table. So I would say through ensuring that we are partnering with them, not just going and talking about the things we're doing, but listening to them because they are the people who were being mostly affected. Their lives and means of livelihoods are mostly affected. So if we can listen to them through collaborative dialogue, being able to engage them, being able to visit them in their places, to understand how in their own way, each of them is contributing to ensure that their voices are heard, then we can better make impact together by focusing on the communities affected and not just making and, and um, drawing up training contents for them. No listening to them to hear what they have to say and what they need. In that way, we are ensuring that their voices are heard and they're also part of the conversation, as well as also empowering their children who were going to school, because we realize that most of the time we have an issue of language barrier. So what we do is that in the trainings that we conduct, we also include children of those women who are in the program, so that through better engagement with them, those of them who were able to understand 
the English language can be able to translate that it to their parents in the local language, thereby also benefiting from the programs that we have and being able to better communicate effectively with their parents who are part of the program for better engagement results. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Adrian, same question for you. Um, the, how can we support and build power for the most vulnerable of communities? Oh, Adrian, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I think the key in uh, uh, making sure that no one is excluded in the process um, is looking at um, investing time on community organizing. Um, we do a lot of community organizing um, and, you know, basically uh, staying with the community um, and understanding the, com the dynamics of the communities, the, the cultural context of how things is um, uh, managed in each community. And um, for our organization, particularly, uh, we employed uh, or we basically use the community-based model in uh, any development of projects in community level. So um, the based model uh, basically involves free prior informed consent, those kind of process of consult consulting the elders, the youth, the women, the different segment to um, what they call uh, focus group discussion. A lot of these um, methods are being employed every the rest of the world. But the key is uh, actually uh, putting more to listen and see what is actually the aspirations of the community. So that is uh, the first step. The second step is to, to gear towards um, or to move towards recognition of indigenous people's rights and roles in terms of managing or to be the custodian of the natural resources, uh, particularly in their territories. And these are so important that uh, without recognizing their role as the custodian of natural resources, that there is very uh, first to move uh, any um, programs that relates to conservation or to the extent sustainable development in their area. Um, and uh, while doing this, we, of course, as an organization like Tony Boom, we, we are responsible of trying to uh, invest our time and effort to how to make the technology accessible uh, to the community, not just, just uh, in terms of cost, but I think um, uh, enabling the community to be able to master the te uh, technology. For example, we are looking at, we talk a lot about renewable energy, but how much time and effort is actually invested towards providing trainings and also, um, you know, uh, handholding to for the communities in, in order for them to fully embrace and the ability to actually um, have uh, uh, the, the competency towards uh, managing and operating uh, systems that we're bringing. Because technology can be en enabling, but at the same time can be excluding. Because it, it, uh, too much technology, you can exclude a lot, uh, especially the older generation. So, so we have to be very careful. Uh, or of what type of technology we bring to the communities. And um, I think the last step of uh, the, also the approach that we take is trying to see uh, tech, uh, technology that is appropriate and suitable culturally uh, for the communities and how to integrate uh, to some level the traditional wisdom. And uh, for example, like, uh, you know, uh, mapping, community mapping, we've been talking about GIS and so on but how can we get uh, traditional knowledge is as part of uh, the program that we are putting in the communities. So that's why when we do the uh, watershed management, we do a lot of community mapping, but it's not just like using GPS and collecting data, but it's also collecting the spatial and the mental maps of the community in order for them to have a very holistic uh, management plan of the particular area. So that's how we make sure that not just excluding persons or groups, but also knowledge uh, in the process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madeline and Adrian, both of you for sharing um, the work that you're doing um, and the the solutions that you've you've raised here and the interventions that your your organizations are working towards. Um, we're gonna 
turn now to breakout groups. There will be three breakout rooms. Um, you have a chance to ask additional questions to the panelists, as well as talk as a group about our second question. How, how are, bring to the breakout group how your organization is working to address the inequalities you're seeing in your context. We'd like to hear from everyone on the call. So if I could have um, my colleagues from Friendship go ahead and break us into the breakout rooms. The breakout rooms will last until um, 10 after the hour. Um, so we'll have about 30 minutes in breakout rooms and you will get a notification when we have about three minutes left. So please go ahead and break us out. Yes, yes. Uh, please uh, give us a minute. We are managing breakout session and groups. Yeah, so the idea of the breakout groups is really to have an open discussion and uh, as, as Hilary said, just share your own experience from your countries, from your organization, from what you know, and just, you know, very friendly discussion on that uh, very interesting. Yes. Let me introduce three facilitators for breakout groups. One, uh, Hilary uh, will facilitate one group uh, and Dorothy. Uh, Chair Friendship uh, Netherlands. She will facilitate one group and Stefan. And after uh, 20 minutes breakout group, we can take a few more minutes, then back to plenary session and two minutes update from each facilitator.
I can't hear you. No. Do you want me to make you some? I'll make it, just shut up. Welcome back. I I believe we had a good session. Thank good you. Record. Thank you. Good. Very good. Great. And now you'd listen from facilitator. Who will start? I would leave with you. Hey, Ladi, Stefan, Dorothy. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to. Well, I'll just go ahead and start. I was in group one, and apologies for the long noises, the leaf blowers. I can't help that. Uh, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, so we had um, kind of a, a very varied conversation, but some of the inequalities that the folks in our group were are dealing with are extreme poverty, mining data exclusion, uh, deforestation. And some of the solutions I heard were uh, the importance of partnerships, um, the importance of uh, leaving no one left behind so that those living in extreme poverty are able to adapt to climate change. Um, and then we started to have a conversation around climate induced migration and how um, folks that are often forced to move because of climate change, they don't always identify themselves as climate migrants. They don't always understand that that's the reason that they're being forced to move. They may point to other reasons. And so how to have conversations with climate migrants and explain, explain uh, the, the very unique situation they've been thrust into. We did not get an answer, uh, but we that was the end of the conversation. Okay, shall I... Um... Report back from group two. I was in group two. We had a very lively discussion, so also very varied uh, topics. We started with discussing more uh, real uh, climate disasters and how uh, we can include everyone in uh, in, in preparation for um, uh, to to deal with uh, climate disasters and. Um, and that we can, uh, that especially in, in Florida was mentioned that there was actually a lot done in preparedness uh, and to uh, try to have everybody participating uh, in, um, in, in, in the preparedness and in, in what plans can be so that everybody gets a role. Um, I think that was something that, that we still can learn from, especially in other, um, in other regions. Then we had a discussion on uh, uh, taking place in Bangladesh, where there's um, there's uh, coming in crops that can deal better with salinity, but it's not very obvious that that is also working very well because it can uh, be disruptive as well. It can be disruptive in uh, uh, food security, and it can also not be totally into, as I understand, the diet of the people and. Also, it, it could also uh, marginalize people more. So 
it is uh, something that is being tested and piloted in communities, but not always, but still uh, have, we have to take a next step on that. But I think Kazi is uh, very much better than me in, uh, in placing this, but I think I've tried to, to word this uh, um, as we discussed it. And then I think there was um, an, another very interesting discussion on um, to, to try to voice uh, or be the voice of, of all the people that are normally excluded in the dialogue. And uh, so that uh, to create platforms that <laughs> we can be a bridge between all those people that, ha that have ideas and work on the ground and that we can connect uh, them to the, to the decision makers, the funders, uh on on different platforms we had a little discussion on how successful this is and actually on the the local action sites there's quite a lot of inputs and uh and and we can be those voices and to see how the bridge will work is still in a in a sort is, is still ha have to be has to be tried out and it's not uh, it's not yet uh, sure uh, and we cannot yet speak of a success but everybody agreed that this was the way to go. And then I think uh, as a last uh, in, uh, thing that I should mention that uh, IIED has uh, some uh, very good, um, or has put some effort in putting um, podcasts together as well as um, uh, inf uh, information and, and, and lectures on um, um, how uh, in, in two years already you have tried to put uh, uh, racism and um, uh, colonialism and how we can do better so that uh, those th th those are in for, uh, integrated in our systems and we are trying to do good but uh, do we do well enough and uh, and you have some very good I think you've you've put something in place that we can all learn from so that is I think from our group too. Thank you, Dorothy. So for uh, group group three, I will be more. Uh, I will go quicker. Uh, so we we, we discuss some some form of, of some kind of problems that may arise. Some in some countries, for example, in Kenya, there was they might have some problems so that the constitution is not really clear regarding the rights of the uh, the, the communities or the policy. In some countries, might not be as uh, favorable than it's it's in Bangladesh, for example, as, as it was mentioned in the presentation. So, um, so yeah, there are always some spaces to to be innovative and to bring uh, to share the knowledge between people who know from the uh, what is existing and and the knowledge from the field. Uh, there are some very practical solutions also um, in each country. There are there are. Yeah, different solutions that exist to to help the communities uh, in terms of uh, of rights, uh, especially the legal side. Uh, to to in some countries the um, uh, the land rights is a big problem. The access to land is a big problem, and and they need to have support for the the people uh, uh, supporting uh, the access to the rights uh, to land. Um, then uh, we also spoke about the visibility that we should give to the frontliners and and share the stories and share their voices so that they have more uh, they're more present in in the discussion arenas at the at the higher level so that their rights are taken into account uh, our co conversation but also into the funding uh, situation we, which has currently uh, a strong imbalance in ter in terms of reach so uh, currently only 10 percent of the funding of uh, for climate adaptation uh, is going really to the uh, communities in need, or to the, the direct frontliners of the climate uh, um, the, of the climate crisis, and and it 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 should change. Uh, we we learned that from FCDO in the UK, they committed to move to seventy percent of the climate finance going to local communities by twenty thirty. So that's a, a big move. So we hope that it will be possible to reach that, and everyone has to take its part. Also the the um southern countries who who should commit to uh, leave no one behind and to uh implement and deliver the the funds that they will receive for the most vulnerable um so yeah that was basically it uh in our conversation and though so i can hand over to uh kazi um, thank you great and it seems all the groups had a very vibrant discussion very good now I would uh, request uh, 
the big voice in climate justice world, a journalist, writer, activist, and above all, Her Royal Highness Princess Esmeralda of Belgium. She's also chair of Friendship Belgium uh, for this concluding speech and uh, given uh, light to our session. Thank you so much, Kazi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for a very interesting session and for reminding us all that the climate crisis, the uh, ecological crisis is above all a problem of human rights because we have a tendency of talking about what is happening to biodiversity, what is happening to our climate and we forget the human aspect. And it's a basic attack on our most basic human rights, rights to life, to food, to water, to education, to safety. And let's talk about climate justice. We cannot dissociate, we cannot address this terrible crisis if we don't address inequality and poverty. Inequity, like uh, Runa Khan said at her opening speech. So we have different kinds of injustice. We have the first one that I see, obviously, is that the Global South, the country that has participated the least in the situation where we are, the climate crisis chaos, are the one uh, suffering the most. And this geographical uh, injustice, uh, I may say, is right before our eyes. We have seen what is just happening in Pakistan. We can see what is happening in in Africa with the terrible drought, and it's happening all the time. We also uh, experience some kind of uh, climate disaster, but not on the same level so far. And of course, we have a historical responsibility because let's remember that when the European powers, the colonial powers started uh, to go to the global south and to take all resources and building their, our wealth, well, everything started there, not only in uh, the destroying of biodiversity, resource, nature, but also the way the population were dominated. Unfortunately, still today, we have that kind of neo-colonialism with many multinational uh, still taking resources from the global south for Europe, for uh, the Western countries. I want also to talk about the gender injustice. We have talked about it during this session, how women and girls are suffering the most because of the role they have in society. Uh, they are the one getting the food, getting the water. Uh, actually, we know that it's 40 billion hours that women and girls spend getting water yearly in Sub-Sahara Africa. This is an incredible number, 40 billion hours. And of course, it, it uh, has the result that they don't go to school, sometimes that they get married very early. And this is exactly a gender injustice. We know that after big uh, climate disaster, yes, they don't go back to school uh, and they are suffering the most. But I have to also insist that women are agent of change because they know they are in contact with resources, natural resources. They have ability, they have skills. Unfortunately, they don't have um, uh, ownership on land or very little. They don't have the skill or the training and that should change and funding should go to that as well. And the last injustice I want to talk about is indigenous rights. We have heard from Brazil, we have heard from Africa, how indigenous communities are suffering because they are displaced. In the case of uh, Brazil, they are also very often killed. The defenders of our most important biodiversity are regularly, regularly mistreated, uh, harassed, killed. We have seen that recently. And they are the ones, again, who have the most knowledge and the most ability to protect their land, their forest, and our biodiversity. There are only 5% that they, that they protect 8% of our biodiversity. 
So I just want to, to state that this injustice, uh, gender, indigenous, geographical, historical, and I think today we have seen that there is a better way to do that, listening to uh, local communities, not imposing our way of seeing things from the north, but having a real dialogue, a real collaboration, and, uh, and helping the most vulnerable, who have a lot also to, to uh, teach us. So I thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, discussion today. Excellent, very moving. Uh, and now uh, uh, we have a CGRF friendship uh, and all other speakers and from different corners of the world. I appreciate your uh, efforts. Hilary, from the day one, we working with Stefan day after day, week after week, we had a different planning session and finally we did it. Now I would request Runa Khan to close the session. I think so much and so beautifully, I, the closing remarks have been articulated by Princess Esmeralda. And thank you for bringing such important issues, which are hidden issues people don't bring to the surface all the time. And you always have this courage to do so. So thank you for that. And thank you for having these, having our three, uh, uh, breakout session specialists who have rounded up the session so well. And Amdad and Friendship and IAED, uh, we are very proud to be part of this team. And I think our session really has been one of learning. And uh, it, is, it is with this solidarity that I hope that we can move together forward and bring this injustice into justice, at least take a step towards it for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Please join tomorrow 12 noon for our session, local government towards local adaptation. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Yeah, this is good night. Thank you, Kazi. Good night. Sleep well, everyone, in that side. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>